Well, back in uh, 2010, Marilyn and I uh, decided to venture into Michigan. Um, prior to then, Michigan was like this black hole on the other side of the border, and we never really knew a whole lot about it. Um, ultimately, we decided to purchase a cottage there. And up until March of 2020, we all know what, what happened then, um, we enjoyed un uninterrupted access to the cottage, and we developed some very strong friendships in Michigan. Um, one of those friends happens to be my barber, Mark, Mark Heberling. Mark is quite a humble person, but he's a dynamo when it comes to political influence. I really love Mark because he fully understands what it is to freely speak, openly and honestly. He also openly de demonstrates his right to protect himself, his family, his property, and his friends. By demonstrate, demonstrate, part, in part by demonstrating his right to bear arms. I never feel threatened, nor will anyone with honest intentions in this shop. I say all this because last thing, Thanksgiving, our, our Thanksgiving, Shane, um, weekend, I was uh, in getting my hair cut when Mark, Mark told me I might want to stick around for a while and meet the future Lieutenant Governor of Michigan as he was dropping by for a haircut. Well, as it turned out, it didn't quite work out the way Mark predicted, but I get, did get a chance to meet Shane. Mark's endorsement is pedigree enough for Shane, but I met an extremely intelligent, very capable, very forthright, very honest gentleman. Being in the middle of a campaign, I knew Shane was extremely busy, but I asked him if he would co consider coming to Canada to speak at one of my functions after things cooled down for him. To my absolute surprise, he agreed. I think it an honor to have a great American leader here to speak to us tonight. It's my great honor to introduce Shane Hernandez to you. Well, a couple of things. One, in Michigan, we use this stuff called salt, and we use a lot of it. And I wouldn't have even been pickup truck stuck if you guys use some salt around here. It'll destroy your car, but I wouldn't have been stuck. Number two, now that I hear you guys are uploading this on social media, I'm concerned for Glenn because uh, I don't know about in Canada, but in the United States, he said people gave him cash so many times, the IRS is over here tallying up how much, how much he didn't pay in taxes on the cash that he was given uh, over his time in Ottawa. So be careful with that. I want to start with one of my favorite quotes. How many people here know who Frederick Douglass is? I mean, Frederick Douglass was a, a slave in the, in the 1830s in the United States. He escaped slavery in 1838, became an abolitionist and a pastor. And it's one of my favorite quotes, and I think it's a, quote, a great quote for a new group like this. He said, I prayed for freedom for 20 years, but received no answers until I prayed with my legs. I hope everybody here prays, but I hope you also, and I see it because you're here tonight, stands up and prays with their legs and goes to Ottawa, goes to their elected officials and talks to them because that's what it takes to get things done. I want to start with a little background. I was going to tell the barbershop story because I've been asked so many times, how the heck did you get here? Um, but I, I will share, um, when I ran for state representative in Michigan, I was looking for a contact in, uh, in Sandusky, and it was actually the treasurer for my opponent's campaign called me and said, you need to go meet the barber in Sandusky. And I thought, well, you work for my opponent. I'm not sure I want to go meet this barber. I don't know who this guy is. And, but I thought, you know what? So I called my dad, and I'm like, well, I need backup. Come with me to meet this barber. We're going to go sit over there. <laughs> and the barber says to me when I get there, he said, thanks for coming out. Uh, you know, your two opponents are idiots, and I just wanted to make sure you're not an idiot before I vote for you. <laughs> and that's how Mark talks, right? <laughs> so I sat there, talked to Mark for probably an hour, and uh, he's like, all right, I'm voting for you. You got my vote. And then this other guy comes in the door. And you can tell Mark's known him for a long time, and he's talking, and, and Mark says, hey, Gary, meet this guy. This is Shane. He's going to be our next state rep. I'm supporting him. I hope you support him. And Gary looked at him, and he said, well, I was coming here to tell you that I was going to run for state rep. And Mark looked at him and said, Gary, I don't care that you're my brother. I already told him I'm voting for him. 
so, so Gary and I sat in the corner in the barbershop that day, talked for an hour, and I talked Gary out of running. Gary ended up supporting me, and I won that race, and here we are. So, um, A little bit about me to understand where I've come from. I talked very briefly about it earlier today, but uh, my last name's Hernandez. My, my, uh, my great-grandparents came across from Mexico, and, and legally, and, and settled in Texas. <laughs> and uh, my father was a World War II vet, or my grandfather was, and uh, he brought my dad and, and the rest of his kids and his wife to, to Michigan to pick cucumbers in the thumb of Michigan. At the age of eight, my dad was a migrant worker working in the fields. His family would send the kids off to Ohio by themselves to pick vegetables. They would go to Texas. They'd come back and forth, but Michigan was home. And I come from, obviously, a very humble family. My mom grew up on a small dairy farm in Lexington, Lexington Heights, actually, uh, right by one of the, the cottage there that you guys have, and, uh, and, and also comes from a humble background. I knew three things growing up. I knew that we were a Latino family, and Latino families in the United States are Democrats. I knew we were very low income, and low income people in the United States are Democrats. And my dad at the time worked for uh, a factory, and he was the union president. And union workers are Democrats. That's all I knew about politics. Didn't understand any of it. I just allowed myself to get placed in those silos and believe it. Now somewhere, I have one brother, he's five years older than me, and somewhere around 18 or 19 years old, he decided he was a Republican. I have no idea how he decided that, but this is my older brother. So I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna do this too. And then I saw how mad it made my dad, which was like, okay, I'm definitely doing this, because <laughs> it drives my dad crazy. So I went the next few years just telling people I'm a Republican, and then I went off to college. And you realize real fast, in a university setting, you better learn to back yourself up. And I went to college for architecture. I actually studied green design and sustainable design at the height of the Al Gore movement, if there was ever such a thing as an Al Gore movement. But, um, <laughs> but professors would attack you. And I realized I need to take a step back and really understand if this is truly who I am and truly what I believe. And I didn't step back and look at who's the Republican in office at the time. It would have been... George W. Bush, I think, it would have been president at the time. I didn't look at what's he doing, what's the Republican Party talking about. I looked at what are the core values? What does it mean to be a conservative? Not even what does it mean to be a Republican. What does it mean to be a conservative? And what I realized looking at that was I never was a liberal. I never was a Democrat. I'd been lied to my entire life. All my dad's family came to the United States for was to live the American dream to work hard, to raise a family, and to have the next generation have a better life. And my mom, she was the faith center of the family. She made sure that we had a faith in God that even 20 years ago didn't align with the left. Now today, it's not even close. You can't even look at it and begin to understand how people can, can see that and can fit that in. And I realized that at my very core, Everything my Democrat dad had taught me was a conservative value. Now, it took my brother and I the next 10 years to get my dad to realize that. <laughs> now, my dad is very, very conservative today, a very outspoken conservative. Um, but as I look at it today, we have a party or a, a political thinking in the United States that I'm guessing is the same way here, that... They want, to, they want you to believe that that dream's not, a, not possible anymore. Can't do that in one generation. You're, you're a minority. That doesn't work anymore. You're low income. The system's against you. Really, it's them creating the system that's against us. They want to keep us held down. And I look at it today, and I realize I'm the first kid in my family to go to college. I have a master's degree. I worked 12 years for a, an architectural firm. I served in the state house, I chaired a $60 billion budget, I ran for Congress, I ran for lieutenant governor, I own three businesses, I've lived the American dream, I am what they are scared of. Yeah. Yeah. When I think, what are we here for, we're here for one reason, my kids are over there, I want to make sure 
they have the exact same opportunity that I have. And I think that's what everybody's here for, their kids and their grandkids and the next generation. So I've, I have two things I wanna talk about today. The first I wanna talk about what is, it, what is true activism? What does it mean for those of you, I mean, I don't think everybody in here is gonna run for office, right? So most of you are gonna be activists. You're gonna be out there supporting somebody running for office. Um, but what does that true activism mean? And there always needs to be a bomb thrower out there, sure. I think a lot of us are really good at that. We can go on social media and send a, a zinger of a comment across. We can show up in front of our elected officials and yell at them, that's pretty easy. It's fun. Sometimes I like it. Um, we also need to learn to be better at their game than they are. And I talked earlier about, in the United States, we call our country a representative republic. And the left likes to call us a democracy. They like to say that all the time. I took a class one time that the first question of the class was, what, are you, what is your activism directed toward? What, what are you guys as an organization, back then we were the Tea Party group, what are you guys as a Tea Party working for? Well, we're working to get this guy elected on election day. And the, and the teacher's response was, you've already lost. Because you're not even working to keep your form of government. If you're working toward election day and election day only, and I'm not telling you to not work toward election day, please work toward election day. But if that's all you're doing, you're working for a democracy. You believe you only have power on election day. You're not working as an activist group to learn how to exercise your power the other 364 days of the year, which is what you do in a republic. Now, this whole thing, this whole class, is, it was called Keep the Republic Training from an organization called the Center for Self-Governance. Whether or not they'll come to Canada, I don't know, but I'd urge you to look them up. It's the best training I've ever had. But it was based off of a famous quote that a lot of Americans know, whether or not you guys know it, I'm not sure. But when Benjamin Franklin left the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, he was stopped by a woman who said, so Dr. Franklin, what did you give us? A republic or a monarchy? And his response was, a republic if you can keep it. Now we'll get into that in a minute, but who asked him the question? And if you do some research on that, you'll find out her name was Elizabeth Powell. So here we're talking about somebody who doesn't even have the power to vote. So if we're a democracy, she has no power ever. She's a woman in America who she can't vote in the 1700s. But somehow Benjamin Franklin came over to her to talk to her when he left. Why would he come to Elizabeth Powell? Well, Elizabeth Powell's husband was the mayor of Philadelphia. And Elizabeth learned how to use that to build relationships. She made her husband host dinner parties at their house. And she would hurry up and clean up when that dinner party was over and sit at the table with them. She became friends with George Washington. He was known to be at their house quite often. And Elizabeth Powell built these relationships over time. So now we have somebody with no power to vote. George Washington, the first president of the United States, served his four-year term, and told his friends he wasn't going to run for re-election. Everybody wanted him to run for re-election. In fact, people were suggesting George Washington should be king, which he responded, we just left that. No, I don't think so. He obviously ran for re-election, became president for a second term, and when asked why he ran for re-election, his answer was, let's just say strong persuasions from Philadelphia. A woman who couldn't vote convinced the first president of the United States to run for re-election through relationships. So let's talk a little bit about that statement, a republic if you can keep it. Because what does that mean? Self-governance takes a lot of work. Allowing the government to feed you, allowing the government to house you, allowing the government to take care of your health care, allowing the government to take care of your education, allowing the government to take care of your homeless, everything the government does today is really easy. It's really easy to step back and say, I don't have the time to figure out how to put together a community health plan. I don't have the time to figure out how to put together a community-based school, which is where we started. 
So we slip away from it over time. And every one of us here has to be vigilant. And, and we, didn't, uh, we didn't lose that overnight either. So don't expect to get it back overnight. Don't be discouraged. Wayne, you took 1%, you went to 10, so I'm expecting 100% the next time to keep up your pace if you're going to keep going tenfold. So we took this class from Center of Self-Governance. They tell us these stories. It, it's hard for some of us to, be, to sit there, we're the tea party, and to be told, you guys already lost, you're doing it wrong. And then they gave us homework at the end of the class. And he said, I, I need each one of you, before I let you take the next class, every one of you has got to go out and you've got to meet with an elected official you don't know. You're going to sit down with that elected official. You're going to ask them a couple questions. You're going to ask them why they do it what they hope to accomplish, and what really is driving them. And then you're going to tell them, I respect you. I know you have a lot to do. I don't want to take up more than 15 minutes of your time. Thank you for sitting down with me. Here's my phone number, and you're going to leave. Every single elected official, I can tell you this from experience, expects you to sit down and yell at us. We expect you to sit down and talk longer than we have time for you to talk. That's how it works. This class is training you to do this different. They're training you to go out and build the relationship. Now, it was hard for me to find an elected official I don't know, because at the time I knew people, I knew my member of Congress, I knew my state rep, my state senator, my county commission, I knew all of them. So I found this school board member I didn't know. I sat down and did exactly that. Two months later, we were fighting a millage. A millage in the US is basically when the government puts a tax increase on the ballot, they will say, we're gonna increase your taxes $2 for every $100,000 of value of your property you own for our schools. There was a $150 million millage on the ballot. I was part of a group going, attacking the millage, which is not the most popular thing to attack, a school millage all the time. But this school board member calls me, the school board member who is on the opposite end of the political spectrum as me, and he said, Shane, you guys are gonna defeat this millage. And I need to sit down with you and understand why. And you're the only reasonable person on that side that I know. Relationships are powerful. This is a guy on the other side who doesn't know a single conservative that hasn't yelled at him, except for one. And he wanted to sit down with me and figure out what is it you want to see different so we can come together and move forward for our schools now. I, he probably wasn't satisfied with my answer, but because uh, they just ended up jamming it through again a few months later. But he's come to me over and over and over again throughout his time on the school board. And again, I will, I will preface this with, there's a time and a place to go light your elected officials up and to light a fire under them. Also get to know them, understand what drives them, understand their family, understand their background, understand who they are and build a relationship with them. I can tell you from experience in office, the person who every single time I interact with them is yelling at me gets to be really easy to just plug my ears and vote against them. But the people who I respect, even if I'm completely against them philosophically, it comes really hard to sit down and tell them, not this time. You guys, that is, that is something you need to go do. We have issues in our school board right now, critical race theory and, and a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have a group who goes to our school board and yells at them. And I tell them, do you even know who these school board members are? Because our group that I, that I work with, is, we've split up and we've assigned people to each one of them. We sit down and have coffee with them and we understand what drives them because trust me, we've already lost <laughs> on CRT and DEI. So we need to understand what drives you? How can we work with you? And then I need, and, and I'm also setting it up for that conversation of, you know what, we're going to make an example of you in this next election. And then we're going to tell your colleagues, did you see what we did? Because you're next. But you have that relationship to be able to talk to them that way. You have a working relationship with them. One last story on the relationship side, even on the inside in the legislature, I had I was rated the most conservative legislator in the state of Michigan in my first term in the legislature. Yet I still managed to... I, I still managed to have relationships with the leadership and work my way into a leadership position. We had a team. I was the guy on the team who wasn't out there 
throwing bombs. I had, if I needed a bomb thrown, I'd go tell another rep who didn't want to be on leadership to go do that. When it came to Governor Whitmer's lockdowns, we had a Republican House and a Republican Senate. And I was the guy in the room with the Speaker of the House who had that relationship to sit there and convince him to put a stop to it. And I remember that day, and it was like your, your freedom convoy. We had thousands of people on the Capitol lawn. And we were headed toward extending her emergency powers. I, we were right there. We were about to go on that House floor and extend her powers. And through that relationship, I was able to convince him to let me sponsor a resolution to enter a lawsuit to strip her emergency powers. And we walked out on the House floor. We dropped that resolution that day, and we voted on it. And we entered a lawsuit and took Gretchen Whitmer to court to strip her emergency powers. So I can't stress that enough that as you go through this, this isn't all attack mode. Some of this is playing their game as well as they do it and learning how to do that. The second piece that I want to talk about is events like this are great. Don't stop them. They're awesome. They're fun. They bring energy. They bring positivity. Just like you, I feel great sitting in a room with people that I know want the exact same thing as me. But if we can't take our ideas to people who aren't like us, we will not win. We can't win. There's not enough of us here. So how do we take our ideas out into our community? How do we approach people who aren't like us? Maxime, you, you said it earlier. If you believe it, say it loud and proud, right? We believe our ideas are the right answers. We know they're the right answers. So don't worry about that. Number one, I, I, again, I'm going to guess that this is the same situation here that it is in the United States, but on this side of the aisle, you, you, you can't be afraid to tell your story. That's why I always open with telling my story and my background, because we let the other side define us. Well, he's Latino, or Lat Latina, Latinx, or Latinx, whatever they want to call it, doesn't even make sense. Uh, it's offensive, but whatever. Uh, we let them define us. I believed as a kid growing up, that every Republican was a rich white person. Just believed it. I never met anybody else, and every Republican I saw on TV fit that. But I'm going to guess every conservative in this room has a story to tell. You didn't all come from a rich background. You didn't all have a silver spoon in your mouth. You didn't all have it handed to you. We come from a variety of backgrounds. The other side plays identity politics really well. They do it great. All we've got to do is be willing to go out there and tell our stories. We're truck drivers, we're farmers, we're business people, we're people who came from nothing and now have businesses. Don't be afraid to tell your story. My dad, if you went and approached my dad on Republican policy, all, the first thing that would come, I listened to Rush Limbaugh, that would be the first thing that would come out of his mouth, and I hate that man. <laughs> you couldn't reach him like that. You had to go to him and say, Dad, you, you're a youth pastor at the church. You're teaching kids this, and your party is teaching them this. Dad, your dad was fought in World War II, brought his family here for something. You have to, we have to be able to make that emotional appeal. We don't do it on our side. You guys have to start being able to do that. We have to start hitting people right here. There's a, there's a little pamphlet called Go for the Heart, How Republicans Can Win. And it would, I'm sure if you read it, it would apply to you guys by David Horowitz. It, you can read it in 20 minutes, find it online. But it's a phenomenal little uh, article about how Republicans or conservatives or whatever you are can start talking from the heart and start reaching people from the heart. Because I, I hope everyone here truly believes that our policies are what will give you a better life and what will give your kids and your grandkids a better life. If you believe that, then you can talk from the heart and do that. So I started a group in Port Huron called Hope Rising. I've done the Tea Party thing, I've done the Republican Party thing, I've done conservative groups, I've been in office, and after losing a few races, I just needed some time away. And then I got those activist juices back, but I wanted to do it different. I didn't want conservative in the name. I didn't want liberty in the name. I didn't want constitution in the name. Because I had a vision of a group that could reach people who, one, reach a group of people who aren't engaged, who think like me, and two, 
go out and reach people who I think at their core believe like me, but nobody's ever approached them before. And if you have a name like Tea Party, you're turned away at the door. You can't do it, right? <laughs> so we engage, we equip, and we empower. So first, where do I go find people who th already think like me but aren't en engaged? And how do I engage them? How do I equip them to be effective activists? How do I empower them to go out? For us, it's in the church. We have so many people in our churches who think like us, but, well, I I'm Christian. I just don't want to get involved. Politics is nasty. Politics is dirty. I actually use Canada as an example to get them involved. Because I live in Port Huron. I can see Canada, right? And I can show them a picture of the pastor in Calgary standing at the top of his stairs with the police at the bottom of his stairs. I can show them a picture a week later of him out in the street getting dragged and getting handcuffed. And I can tell them, across an imaginary line and that St. Clair River right there, that's how close we are to this happening here you getting arrested for having church. That's how close we are to it. And you may think you don't want to engage in politics, but believe me, politics is going to engage in you. It's coming to you. And if you don't engage it, it's going to engage you on its terms, and you're not going to like it. So it's time for the church to get involved, and it's time for you to get your people involved and help them understand how to take their biblical values to their elected officials. So we've been teaching, we've been doing biblical citizenship classes all over our county. If you haven't heard of Wall Builders, David Barton, Biblical Citizenship, it is a free online class that you can have your church do that talks about the importance of your church getting involved. So we engage them, and then we find ways of how do we take that and we, get, we take it to the streets to reach people who aren't like us. And we've found multiple ways to do it so far. Does anybody know who Dave Ramsey is? Financial Peace University, Total Money Makeover. It's Christian, conservative, financial principles. So I go to the recovery center for recovering addicts in Port Huron. And I ask them, can I teach financial classes to the people going through recovery? In reality, I'm teaching them Christian conservative principles, but... It's just Dave Ramsey's financial piece. I'm not teaching them that. Go plant the seed. We don't have to go all the way right now, right? You plant the seed. You, you, you start to talk to them about the basics. What's amazing is in some of these classes, I'll get questions like, wow, man, most of the rich people I see are miserable. Why is this different? Those are the opportunities to talk about. Well, if you know Dave Ramsey, the seventh step is to give with no expectation to receive anything in return because it's biblically based then I can start to open up of why this is important. We, I've been reaching out to the Muslim community. Dearborn, Michigan, the largest concentration of Muslims in the United States. Well, they found a book in their schools that tells their children how to change their gender. It was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to go sit down and tell them we have something in common. And yes, our side has ignored you for a long time. Yes, there's probably things we don't understand about each other. But let's have a real conversation about this. Let's build a relationship. And I love those conversations because they're straightforward. They will tell you, I don't, I, I don't trust you. You're doing this just because you're running for office. And I said, well, right now we're trying to help your kids so you can decide what you want to do. But I promise you when this election's over, win or lose, I'll be back. And I have been back. And now we can sit down and say, I don't know if we understand each other on national issues. Those aren't the issues affecting our families right now, so let's set them aside. And I believe in the next couple months, I'll be helping them start a conservative activist group based off of the same principles as Hope Rising in Dearborn, Michigan. And Gretchen Whitmer, in the Muslim portion of Dearborn in 2018, took over 80% of the vote. And in 2020, she took just barely over 50% of the vote. And that was with four weeks of work. We're going to have two, two years of work this next time. Two years of relationship building this next time. There are huge opportunities in the Latino communities. These are, these are families with family values that just want to work. Go ask somebody on the left what their first agenda item is, and it's going to be something crazy. It sure as heck isn't going to be their pocketbook 
or their kids. We have opportunities all over the place. Start to think about this. We're going to start doing entrepreneurship classes because young kids like I was that came from a low-income family, they, do, they believe that there is a system holding them down. They don't understand that somebody can come aside them, alongside them, mentor them, and they can be a business owner. Those are the keys that unlock ingenuity, which is conservatism in my opinion. We are we bringing in a speaker named Ismail Hernandez, not a relation to me, um, but Ismail's dad founded the Communist Party in Puerto Rico. Ismail was trained to be a revolutionary, travel the country or the world and spread communism. He got sent to the United States. He was furious. He calls it the belly of the beast. When he came to the belly of the beast, he realized it wasn't what he thought it was. And Ismail's goal in life today is to destroy his dad's old go own government in Puerto Rico. He tells a story that he and his dad never spoke after he started doing this. But when his dad was dying, he called Ismail and said, I don't understand what it is you believe, but if it's what you believe, you sure as heck better fight for it. So he's coming to Port Huron another way to get into our community to teach what he calls effective compassion. Let's take our soup kitchen, for example. What does our soup kitchen do? It teaches people that you can come here for soup every day. That's what it teaches them. Does anybody at the soup kitchen find out why they're coming there for soup? Find out what the core problem is? Find out what other service they can connect them to to get them out of that situation? A real soup kitchen should want to put themselves out of business, right? They want nobody to be coming back for soup. And Ismail will say, don't be mad at the person for abusing the government program or your program that you created, because you created it. Give them something better. Teach them life skills. Transition your organizations to teach true compassion, Christianity, conservatism, whatever it is, and these are, this, these are ways to get out into the community and plant these seeds and, and play this long-term game. So, you know, I hope you guys are able to do that through this organization. Because you're, everything I've heard here, your principles, your ideas, your policies are spot on. But we don't always win on policy. The average voter doesn't care about policy know that we have the winning policy, but we have to present it in a different way. We have to build relationships. The only way you can approach people like this and win them over is one-on-one. -on -one. He's probably not gonna do it posting on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, right? It's one-on-one -on -one relationships. For every person you go to bring here next time that thinks like you, find that person at your church that is on the other side and start sitting down and talking with them, and learn a little bit from them too. Understand why they believe that way. Understand what drives them. And, I, and rhino is the favorite word in, in the United States right now, Republican in name only. And I'll get called a rhino every now and then because my Hope Rising group doesn't go yell at people. It's like, you know what, I don't care. I really don't care anymore because for 12 years I did activism where I had the same 50 people in the room every time. And I preach to the choir every time. And I can go to a Hope Rising meeting now and I look around and I'm like, there's 30 people here I don't know. That's success. That's growing our movement and, and getting bigger. So I encourage every one of you to go out, build relationships, be confident in your message and your policy, outwork your opponents, pray, rely on God, and go out and win. Thank you.